Okay. Uh, sorry, I guess we had a bit of an issue with the daylight savings. Um, and just as Cam mentioned, we will be recording this for educational purposes and because there's been a mix up with daylight savings and timing. And if you do not wish to be recorded, feel free to turn off your video camera and you won't be recorded. Thank you. Um, all right. So thank you for joining us today. And this is my first webinar, so I'm a bit nervous and it might. It, thank you for joining. Um, this is mostly to give us an introduction on the native indigenous plants and get us to learn more about them and uh, I guess appreciate them for what we might have taken for granted and how to attract some wildlife to our gardens, our local gardens and just the interesting interactions between wildlife and plants. So the specialists that I've got invited to speak are Rob and Jim. And Rob, would you like to give yourself a little introduction? Yeah, so just quickly, um, my involvement with uh, particularly Indigenous plants and wildlife friendly gardens has sort of originated um, about 25 years ago. I started getting involved with the Southern Dandenongs Indigenous Plant Nursery, which is up here in the Dandenongs, of course, where I am now. Um, so I was involved in that and uh, my dad had the foresight, I guess, to bring me along to all of those um, tree plantings, which go back to the mid nineties and also to the nursery to volunteer and to pick up um, an understanding about Indigenous plants. And then later on, I've gone on to study in conservation land management. And at the moment, I'm doing third year environmental science at Deakin. Um, and I've got my own small business that I've been running for the last eight years, uh, doing vegetation management, a little bit of lecturing recently, um, and also doing things like creating and implementing management plans and that sort of thing. So that's my background in a nutshell. Great, thanks for that, Rob. And Jim, can you give us a bit of intro about yourself? Um, yep, uh, I currently, I've lived in Hawthorne now um, and I'm involved with the, a group called the Growing Friends of Yarrabin Park, uh, for which I volunteer on, on a Wednesday every week. And we, we, um, uh, we, we grow plants, so that's what we do, and we contribute to or we provide the plants for the, um, the different friends groups in the lower mid Yarra. And we, we certainly don't want to be competitive with the Indigenous nurseries, but it's something that uh, just, um, you know, the, 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 our members enjoy doing. And they're all about my age, semi-retired, retired. And, uh, but I started out on a sheep farm up at, uh, between Wallen and Romsey. Um, and we had 21 micron merinos, <laughs> uh, and you certainly, uh, yeah, and, and the, from that, I ended up being one of the founding, I was the first chairman of the Upper Maribyrnong Catchment Link here group, um, and I was a terrible chairman, but um, this was in the mid-1980s, and I used to buy plants from Darcy Duggan, the late, sadly late Darcy Duggan, at a place called Trees Galore at Moreland High School, which became Vink, the Victorian Indigenous Nurseries mm. Co-op, as we know it now. And they back onto our nursery in Yarrabin Park, Vink don't do. Um, but in my 40s, when, when we at the sheep farm, I was working in my fa family, my father's engineering business, and I was a square peg in a round hole. But fortunately, his factory was in Richmond, so I ended up doing a grad diploma, a one-year full-time at Burnley in horticulture, and that was fantastic. And I stretched it out to about four years, a one-year job. And then from that, my involvement with the, um, well, having this grad diploma in horticulture and um, and the Upper Maribyrnong Catchment Group, I then got, got employment with Green Australia, a non-government organisation, which I worked for uh, for about a bit short of 30 years, 28 years, something like that, but working a lot of it all over Victoria, 
so which was fantastic because you get to work with a whole lot of different people, including many Aboriginal people in little ways, which I really thoroughly enjoyed that. And um, so while we're talking about a habitat today, and that's what I've done many talks on habitat gardens, and my, wild, uh, my favourite is the wildflower rooms. We have room-sized garden beds in, in any garden with whatever plants in it, and you fill that chock-a-block with all the wildflowers. <laughs> with the view that the layer on our farm that's missing is the ground layer. And so anybody with a little, 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 with a little garden at the back of um, Fitzroy or Clifton Hill or wherever it is, you can still make a difference if you're filling your garden up with all our little wildflowers, because they're the layers that are missing, the layer of vegetation, the most diverse layer on the two thirds of Victoria that's freehold, it's farmland and you know, housing house subdivisions and all that sort of thing. But anyway, enough. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, I guess now we'll throw back to Rob, who'll give us a, a, a more complex overview of the native plant. No worries. Thanks, Thanks Katrina. Um, so I was thinking we go back into the history of it a little bit and think about where the concept, I guess, of Indigenous plants have come from. And it's a relatively recent concept in Australia. It's only up until the 1980s or so, we were still planting predominantly Australian native plants in the landscape. So, and this legacy can be seen from previous plantings on things like roadsides and what have you, of things like the lemon scented gum, the bottle brush, the grevilleas, the hakias, and other introduced wattles that are typically from interstate. But over time, we've come to recognise there's a distinct difference between Australian native plants and Indigenous plants. Australian native plants could refer to plants that are growing on the other side of the state or even the country. That is, these plants do not grow in your local area. Sweet Potosporum, for example, was a commonly planted as a garden plant. It's got its aromatic flowers and it can form a dense hedge. However, its natural range in Victoria is predominantly in East Gippsland. This plant is a weed in the Melbourne region where it can shade and outcompete Indigenous plants. A similar example is Yakuta Mundra wattle, Acacia baileyana. It's got this silvery, uh, silver kind of grey foliage and it's often planted as a hardy drought tolerant plant. This is another Australian native plant that's classified as a weed in the Melbourne region. This plant only occurs naturally in a small area up in the River Rainer region of New South Wales. So in the 1980s, the community started to recognise the value of local Indigenous plants. And that we need to sort of understand that in a garden setting, Australian native plants are good, but Indigenous plants are best because they adapted to the local conditions. So in the 1980s, we had groups like Dink, the Victorian Indigenous Nursery Co-op that Jim mentioned before, and even Bayside Community Nursery um, slightly beforehand. They formed as some of the earlier groups in Greater Melbourne. So, and our understanding then became that Indigenous plants are plants that occur in our local neighbourhood. These are unique plants that you won't get at your commercial nursery or at your local Bunnings. So we are lucky today to have dozens of Indigenous plant nurseries that are spread across Victoria. Many of them are operated um, by the community and they've got a range of dedicated volunteers that are able to assist. Each nursery collects seeds or cuttings or plant material to grow local provenance plants, protecting local genetic integrity of species. Thinking back to our local garden, we need to consider things like a site assessment. What plants will you retain? What needs to be removed? And what you might keep? What exotic plants might you keep? So think about how you can dedicate potentially 20% or more of your yard space to an indigenous plant garden. So as we may need to remove some of these introduced species to create some space for the indigenous plants, Think about removing these plants progressively and check for things like animal use. That could be possum drays, bird nests, or even bats in the crevices of old trees. Consider what plants are exotic, but may not be weedy. They provide habitat and are potentially worth retaining. 
So many properties still have a huge area of grass in the front and backyard. So consider replacing some of your grass with a low maintenance indigenous garden. We can minimise the grass and even if we want to retain it, consider a, an indigenous lawn of Microlinus depoides, our weeping grass. It's a hardy local grass that doesn't grow very tall and has a much deeper root system than most introduced grass, grasses and it's more drought tolerant, provides habitat for indigenous species. When you're starting to switch to an indigenous garden, you're reconnecting with your local environment. So here's some things to consider. What type of soil do you have? Is it clay where it's waterlogged in winter and it's dry in summer? Or do you live in the sand belt region where you've got very well drained soil? And consider the aspect of your planting. Some plants need to be in a shaded environment. Some plants need to have full sun, some need partial sun. So what you might consider is even if you don't live on a slope and have the influence of aspect, you might still have shading from surrounding trees, houses, or even buildings. Um, so consider your positioning of your plants. Where do you want to put them? Think about your placement. And also it's important to think about, consider planting a mix of short lived and also longer lived plants. You might use your shorter lived plants, which are faster growing to establish a screen with your neighbours or potentially the front row. Consider having a mix of things. So it's much better to have a range of different species rather than just one. So it'd be good to have an understory mix of plants that could include things like your grasses, your herbs, your wildflowers. A lot of people don't want to plant trees because they may get too tall in an urban setting and your yard might be small. But how about planting some small trees? Things like Australia's floral emblem. You've got your acacia pink anther, the golden wattle or even lightwood, acacia implexa. Some of your eucalypt species are worth considering too, because we need to consider that we are replacing the tree canopy that we've lost in urban areas over time. We want to provide habitat and lessen the impact of things like the urban heat island effect. Something we experience, particularly in Melbourne, when we get these 40 plus degree days and things, our, our infrastructure, can often fail and railway lines buckle. And what we do find is where you've got the shading of trees on your railway line infrastructure is that it doesn't, it doesn't buckle so much. And it's a similar situation where you've got your house, you've got shading of trees, then it reduces your need to have things like air conditioning in your very hot, dry summers that we experience in Melbourne, reducing your usage of electricity for cooling. So when you're planning your garden, Always try to use local material first. When we import materials into our garden, we don't know what we're bringing into the site. For example, mulch may be contaminated with weed seeds and potentially pathogens too. So it's the same with soil. There's really no such thing as clean fill. What may seem like a good idea to introduce soil into to fill in a steep uh, valley or even to build up a low-lying area on a property can have unintended consequences. It can change the hydrology of the site and potentially introduce weed seeds too. Mulch can be a very useful tool to prevent weeds and retain soil moisture. We do have to be careful about how we go about introducing wood chip mulch and, and what we, what we want to do with it. It has a tendency to increase the nutrient, the soil nutrient, as it breaks down in what is classically in Australia, a phosphate and nitrogen um, nutrient deficient soils. So you've, another thing to consider is what is your soil profile doing? Have you got a natural soil profile or has it been altered? If you've got an unnatural soil profile, you might have an inverted soil layer. So you've got your subsoil clay sitting on the top because you've had excavations. And this is common around houses where it's built into the slope and you've lost the topsoil. You may consider introducing mulch to improve your soil. We need to consider that mulch only lasts for a short period of time, maybe a couple of years, depending, um, maybe a couple of years, depending on the mix of leaf and wood material. If possible, use local material if you've got some. And that could be your leaf 
your leaf litter, your bark, um, that's come from the acacias and even the eucalypts. This leaf litter, which often ends up in our green waste bin, is critical habitat for many of our insect species. A critical component to also think about in a wildlife friendly garden is incorporating the abiotic factors. So that is the non-living components into your garden. And these may include features like your rocks or your logs or even your water for wildlife to drink. And if you're gonna provide water, you wanna have a shallow pool of water with some sticks where birds can access the water. And so they don't, unfortunately in some circumstances, if it's too deep, they might drown. So, so thinking about your microclimate, you know, for our invertebrate species, but also for the reptiles and frogs that need protection from the birds. Logs are a critical component that we are quick to remove after they fall in a storm and they often end up as firewood. These logs provide a range of habitat features. You'll often find species that, um, that need cooler and moist environments growing next to logs in nature. If you're on the Victorian volcanic plains and you have big volcanic rocks, Think about how you can place these rocks in your garden, retain them for things like your skinks and your lizards. They're also great habitat for your invertebrates. Um, and think about as well, yeah, logs are a critical component that we've lost in the landscape. So some of the questions we wanna ask when we're creating a wildlife friendly garden. How do we know what to plant where? Local councils are a great resource and many have brochures which will tell you what sort of plants will grow in your local area. And there's even been some booklets that have been produced. So here we've got plants of the sand belt region. Um, other councils have got brochures here which tell us about the indigenous plants of our local area. So starting with the council, but also speaking to your local indigenous plant nursery, they'll be able to provide you with suitable advice to tell you where these plants might occur and where they'll do well. And another, another option is to head down to your local park or reserve. Have a look at what grows well there, because that could be a reference point for what you can bring into your native garden, into your indigenous garden. Chances are it will grow well there as well. So an indigenous garden, it is important to know, important to recognise that it's a great way for us to reconnect with our local environment. You will be able, you'll be able to see the um, different seasons in your garden. People nowadays walk into a supermarket and we get all kinds of fruit and vegetables all year round. We've become disconnected to those subtle changes that we see and those seasonal variations. So one of the key messages I wanted to make is even if you've got a 200 square metre block in the middle of the city or an apartment with just a balcony, you can still grow indigenous plants. You can put them in pots. You can, and you can still provide habitat for indigenous species. So a friend of mine, even down in Abbotsford, had a blue tongue lizard in a very urban garden, garden which was about five by five metres. Um, if you're adamant that your garden's full, consider moving to the nature strip and doing some planting there. And if you don't have a nature strip, maybe consider heading down to your local friends of group, which there are plenty around, and consider helping out there. And sometimes it's nicer to work with a group of people because you'll pick up things as you go. And think about setting an objective. What do you want to achieve? Local indigenous plants are far cheaper than plants from your Bunnings or your commercial nurseries. People are tempted to get advanced plants and our experience tells us that these plants don't form proper root structure and they can be potentially root bound. So what you're looking for is stuff like this. That's our tube stock that we get down at our local indigenous plant nursery. This is just growing in a forestry tube and a nice healthy plant, little bit of roots starting to come through the bottom, not too much. And that tells us that it's an established plant ready to go in the ground. So, I mean, in a nutshell, the other thing to consider um, is that we all have the power to observe things around us. So we can, 
you know, we tend to use our eyes a lot, but we've got other senses too, you know, our sense of touch, our sense of smell, um, and of course, hearing what, what we can hear around us. So we incorporate all those different features and think about, it, it's not necessarily a question of what can the environment do for you? It's more of a question of what can you do for the environment? How can you create a habitat friendly garden? And it's incorporating all these different aspects. And you don't necessarily need a book or a manual to help you. You go down to your local environment group, um, your nursery or your friends of group, and they'll be able to give you their time of day to point you in the right direction for what you're looking for. Whether it's weed control, planting, what suitable plants in your area, um, how to manage particular weeds, all these different things, um, how to attract birds, butterflies into your garden, these groups and your local council will be able to help and assist you with this topic to be able to get your wildlife friendly garden in your place in the Greater Melbourne region. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass over to Jim. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, th thanks, Rob. And uh, and look, you, you might learn a little bit, pick up one or two things from us tonight, but I'd be saying that joining your local friends group, and if they do have a community nursery, nearly all of the probably mid 45, something like that, Indigenous plant nurseries across Melbourne are very happy to see volunteers. And that's where you'll learn about your plants and chewing the fat over a cup of tea when you're you know, pricking out little seedlings. Um, you, you're going to learn heaps more than you'll get in a, a little bit of a grab tonight at, at our Zoom meeting. Anyway, I was just going to talk a little bit about um, some of my friends. And, <laughs> um, and I've got two tubes here that Rob was talking about. Am I getting them both? Yeah. And one's Coria uh, uh, Reflexa um, and Coria Glabra. Coria glabra is a rock coria, reflex is a common coria. And oh, here you go. And they are winter flowers. But I did manage to find a little bit of flowering coria today down at the Glenfree Pool. So I've got to find my flowers, but you can see them. Oh, where, where's my flowers going? Where's my camera? What am I going to do? Oh, there we are. Can you see a little bell shaped flower there? but it's beautifully shown on Katrina's slide anyway. These tubular flowers, and I'm not sure which that, that one is. It may not even be Reflexa or, or Glabra. We do have Coria alba for people who are working with coastal vegetation, like the Kilda Indigenous Nursery people, and, and that's Coria alba. But the ones which I'm most familiar with is Coria glabra and Coria reflexa. And I reckon it's a really profound thing to be sitting out in your back garden, having a cup of coffee and you're sharing your space with a honey eater. And that's a Eastern Spinebill. No, uh, oh, do you know okay. your birds, Rob? <laughs> it's either an Eastern Spinebill. Or I get there's a two, two uh, what are the two common the honey, honey eaters we get? Eater. New Holland, that's the one, yeah. Or the Eastern Spinebill. But if you're having one of those, and here they are, picking out on the plants that you've planted, and and uh, and they're you know big nectar producers, so honey that they and that's what they're using their long bills for the honey eaters. And I reckon that's a really profound gardening experience uh, compared to say smelling an exquisite rose. And it's not putting down people who enjoy their roses, but to have some of Australia's wildlife visiting you in your garden largely because you've provided the resources for them. Um, and particularly in winter time, that makes corias they are a beautiful plant. You can have one in just about every garden in Melbourne, one or two, more than one, uh, one but um, maybe you won't get those honey eater experiences if you're right in the middle of suburbia. And we don't get them much in our garden in Hawthorne, but I think it's just a fantastic thing to sharing your cup of coffee in the morning with all these visitors. And in, with the case of corries, they could be visiting you more likely in winter when they're flowering. The bulk of our flowers with all the nectar and pollen are in springtime. And that nectar and pollen it attracts a whole heap of invertebrates, all the insects, our butterflies. 
and that in turn will attract all our insectivorous uh, birds in particular, and all of our honey eaters are, are insectivorous. So um, they're either getting pigging out on nectar or pollen, or they're pigging out on the insects that have been attracted by the nectar and pollen. So, um, and, and that's the you know the rationale behind it. And the, the corries I mentioned, oh, well, actually we've got uh, my piece of paper here. I need to sit back a bit. They're the two corries that I mentioned. Um, but they're, they're, they're well known. The other one, and I, I actually decided that I would, uh, I, was, I was going to talk about, I have visitors to my garden in the summertime. Um, and they come along and pig out on my tree violets when the fruits are ripe. Now, this is a bit of tree violet. And you can see little, little, can you see? Where are we? Hold it up near your face. Yeah. There we yeah. are. Oh, up near my face. Oh, no, see those little, little tiny fruits that are starting to form? They won't be ripe until summertime mid-January, and they'll be about a cent or centimetre, maybe a centimetre round, and they'll be grey in colour. That's my experience anyway. And that's when I get the silver eyes, come and visit my garden and pig out on my tree violets. And tree violets, where, where they're pigging out on them, you end up with seeds being pooked all over your garden. So I've got way too many tree violets in my garden. They are a big medium shrub, which you can uh, hedge them if you like. But they, um, but they, I've got too many, and the birds are going to continue while they're eating them and picking out and dropping the seed. You know, when they're um, sitting on their roosts on the fence or on, in shrubs, um, and so I get the, the things, the wretched things keep coming up. I often just dig them up and pop them into a tube um, to um, pop them into a tube. One of what Rob was one of these things again. Um, that that uh, and, um, and 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 give them away or play, give them to other people uh, or at, with the growing friends group, and so that that one is a tree violet, which is Melocytus dentata, dentatus, yeah. And if you go up to Westerfolds Park, where you sort of drive across from Templestowe to to Eltham, in there. The, it's wall to wall all along the Yarra River, River frontage in Westerfolds. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's chock a block, and and they're not a high priority. I know in Yarrabin Park because they're coming up everywhere. And why would we be surprised? Because we're feeding birds, and the birds are spreading them everywhere. And it's a damn sight better to have them digging out on tree violets or kangaroo apples or other fruiting native speed plants rather than well. Where I come from in the Maribyrnong catchment, we used to have box thorns, but you'll also get cotonias. There's lots of weeds which have fruits, which have seeds, which they will spread, and, and the plants will be coming up everywhere. And I reckon we want all our birds to have their guts full, that they've got some choice in what they eat, and they'll be probably promiscuous. They'll eat whatever they feel like, but let's give a, get, make sure we have plenty of our fruiting plants that produce droops or berries with lots of seeds in them. And so we're likely to get lots of recruitment uh, where, where the birds roosting sites are and, and, and um, like, like my tree violets. Um, so on, the, on this was another, this is one of which I'm, I'm gonna, oh, how can I, that actually is my bird bath on a 40 degree day in my garden and if you look very closely although I, it's not a very big image it's a reduced image here um, but there are about 10 little silver eyes around the edge of the, the my bird bar and this was on a 40 plus degree day and they're all with their little beaks open because they you know a really hot day and they I, but they, they, they were in my garden in the middle of summer because they were pigging out on those tree violet fruits that I'd, my, my plants were providing for them. So you want to go to uh, to, um, to Eltham Coppers now. All right, we'll go to Sweet Basaria. They're, they're, that's Basaria spinosa. That's uh, that one. And it's how many stories do you want with Basaria spinosa? It's a fantastic plant that uh, a long-lived uh, medium shrub, as was the tree violet, 
And in fact, if you go into the, the, the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne, just inside the entrance or near the astronomer's residence, um, off near the National Herbarium, uh, there, are, there is uh, some Bessaria there, which are on the, um, the significant trees list, the heritage tree list. So they, they can live a hundred years. There's some very big specimens in Yarra Bend. Um, so they are long lived, and they, but they won't be massive. They're a, a large shrub or a small tree, but they have this wonderful uh, association with, uh, with ants and the copper butterflies, in particular the Eltham copper, but other coppers as well. And they are um, the, the food plant for the, for the caterpillars. Uh, and in fact, they, the mother or the adult butterfly lays its eggs at the foot of or um, uh, 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 in the ground uh, next to the, the, uh, the, um, the sweet Bessaria. And, and there was an article in the uh, Victorian Landcare magazine uh, all about these things. And I thought I'd read a little bit if I can read it. Um, the Eltham copper butterfly, uh, it, it lays its eggs at the base of the sweet Bessaria. The eggs hatch and uh, the larvae make their way to the ant's uh, nest where they are um, tended by these attendant ants. And this is the not on not onkus not onkus the the the, the uh, Latin name this is the not onkus um, the butterfly larvae are believed to give off chemicals and make those uh, and, and and helps to pacify the ants so they pa removes pacifies the ant aggression uh, and mimics the um, the the ant uh, brood hormones. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah, and attracts and alerts the ants when the larvae are um, alarmed. Um, the butterfly larvae produce a sugary substance, excretion, uh, which the, uh, from their bodies, which the ants feed on. Um, and then the... Uh, knowing exactly how much to produce for the number of ants that they need to guard them. The nocturnal ants uh, then are led uh, out by the, uh, the ants to feed on the Bessaria leaves. And, uh, and then the Bessaria uh, and, oh, and, defend, and, oh, and the ants will defend them from the many nocturnal predators that may see them as a juicy snack. The larvae pupae in or near the ant's nest with adult butterflies emerging from October to March each year, peaking from November to early January. The adults then feed on the nectar from the sweet Bessaria flowers. Um, and that's the, the bit that gets me because these are late flowering. They're summer flowering. They're sweet is because they have a, an aroma. But here you've got, in this case, and often it's you won't have this, where the adult butterfly lays its eggs on the plant, the leaves, which um, uh, the caterpillars will feed on, but then to actually provide the flowers uh, from November to January. And I reckon that's pretty neat, where they're catering for both the, the, butterfly, the caterpillar form, but also the adult butterflies. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, what else? Now I've got, uh, so uh, what else have we got here now? That's the tree bark. The butterflies, yeah. So you've got this three-sided relationship between the, these ants, the non, or whatever they are, the, the ants, the elfin copper butterflies, and the bright copper, there's a number of coppers. Um, but this uh, sort of a t having a tendon ants is quite common with many butterflies. And when you get Butterflies of Australia, the book, um, it actually has 
the, the plant books don't tell you much about the fauna that they support, but the butterfly certainly does in talking about the, the, the pupae, the, 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 um, the plants that are the food plants for the pupae. And in fact, I think we've got about 400 butterflies in Australia, about 130 of them you could associate with Greater Melbourne, but realistically, you're probably going to get 40 or 50 in, uh, you know, in, in, in inner Melbourne anyway. Um, so, uh, and most of them, they need warmth and moisture. So they all live in Queensland, would you believe? <laughs> the bulk of the 400 uh, Australian butterflies. Um, yeah. That's all right. Um, thanks yeah. for that. Well, I was going to do a little bit on spiny headed mat brushes too. Oh, yes. Okay. So, yes. Uh, we can talk about those. I've got a little bit of time left. So this is the spiny head and mat rush, strappy plant, strappy uh, leaves. One of the main basket weaving plants for the Wurundjeri women. And when, when I've worked for Green Australia, we'd do school activities, all these multiple activities, bug, bug blitz and planting seedlings. But we got Jemina, a young woman from the uh, Wurundjeri uh, co-op, and she would do the basket weaving with the kids, just an introduction. And I'd have to go around and harvest all the Lamandra longifolia, which is proportionately very ubiquitous in nearly every rebitch site in Melbourne. But it means you've got a lot of Lamandra foliage to, to, to harvest for the, um, for the basket weaving. But they, they've got a number of the ochre butterflies been on Lamandras as a, as a genus, as a group of plants but in particular, Lamandra longifolia for a number of the ochres. Um, and the, the adult lays its eggs on it, and it's like that, the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. They didn't have strawberries on Wednesday. When they hatched out, they had Lamandra leaves. So it's a, it's a wonderful plant, the, the old Lamandra. And I was going to do a little bit on Myrnal. And I don't know where they come from, but I'm interested in all the Aboriginal plant foods. So did I show you the spiny headed mat brush? That's, that's the plant. But there are other lamandras as well, Hiliformis and a number of others, and a number of cultivars doing the rounds as well. The next one I was gonna talk a little bit about was Myrnal, which was the staple food of, the, um, of nearly all the Southern Aboriginal moles. Um, certainly in the grasslands and grassy woodlands. And this is a pot with some in my garden with the yellow flowers like a dandelion. And they have this edible tuber, um, which, uh, uh, but they, and every year when my, my Myrnong are flowering, I get these hoverflies visit me. And we have hundreds of species of native bees and hundreds of species of native flies. Many of them haven't even been described yet. So the plants I'm telling you about a little bit about and their animal associations. This is the tiny little top of the, of the, uh, the iceberg. There's all this knowledge of all the thousands of uh, in insects, invertebrates that we have. And uh, we, 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 we don't know, but we know very little about many of them. So when you get into doing a bush garden, you've suddenly got yourself a chore for the rest of your days to learn all your plants, and to learn all about your plants and their animal associations and getting to know your birds. And, uh, and I'm a big advocate for um, having a bird list on your fridge. Uh, and, but your first thing to do then is to sit in your garden when there's lots of nectar and pollen around, whatever, the, whatever there is there, and just try and to monitor your birds. You'll need to get onto a, um, you know, and we've got a plethora the fantastic field guides for all the birds, but and but birds are particularly engaging, and so you know getting to know them um, and and knowing about their food requirements um, that you can then plant uh, put in plants that that, that will support them, um, and like the coriers and all the nectar producers that um, uh, uh, yeah. But I was going to talk about, oh, look, I've got a few more props here, except my, so this is a vanilla. Now this is a, oh, it's all closed up now. Where, where, where do I put this plant? Is there a bit of a plant? Can you see a bit of plant there? <laughs> it's yeah. a chocolate lily. And the flowers have closed up now. 
and the chocolate in the name is because they smell of ch chocolate. And so it's good having mass planting of chocolate lilies. And they commonly go with this, which is a bulbine lily with, with yellow flowers. So in your grasslands, grassy woodlands, these two lilies and others are quite common. And it's a great experience to have uh, lots of chocolate lilies. And if you're downwind, and the, well, I was talking to the Parkstreet lady at Yarra Bend today, and she was saying that the chocolate lilies, are, it's a fantastic season for a lot of our wildflowers. And if you're downwind, I reckon if you've got thousands of chocolate lilies and they're flowering now, or they are in the lower Yarra at Yarra Bend Park, and they certainly were up at, along the Wallen Darrowit Road when I was up there oh, just a few days ago as well. A mess of them, massive of them in a, a, a roadside reserve that our Lanky group has adopted, and we, you know, remove all the rubbish and um, and a little bit of odd weed, weeding every now and then. Um, but yeah, so that's Arthropodium strictum as the chocolate lily. Oh, I've got a picture there as well. So there's Arthropodium strictum and the tubers, and there's the Arthropodium. And his bulbine bulbosa, which is the bulbine lily, the yellow one, and again the tuber. So uh, these lilies are all edible; they're bush foods. And so as are all our orchids. I must say, I've never dug up any orchids to eat the tubers, but as as are the myrnong that I mentioned before. Um, so I think is that about me? Is it? Yeah. Bird list on the fridge. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, Jim. Your passion is very uh, inspiring. And although I've heard these before, I love hearing you um, <laughs> tell us about all the different magical, unique mm. relationships between plants and... Um, in progress. And in progress. Uh, yeah. So where are we? Okay. Um, we have a little bit of time for some questions. Is is anyone inspired to ask a question? <laughs> uh, no. Oh, Lisa. Yes. Can I just ask about plants for bellbirds, bell miners? If anyone right. can help me with that. I think the lerps. You'll get them there. Uh, you know, they'll feed on the lerp, psyllid insects. Which are often yes. um, along the on the red gum leaves along the Yarra, where, where I go walking along the Yarra Trail, but um, but I, I'm not sure what else they are in the honey eater group though. So I'd be imagining they'll be insectivorous and they'll be feeding on nectar producing plants. Um, and whether they like the well, you know, the eucalypts are massive nectar nectar producers. So they I think the the little lerps, the little white houses that the psyllid insect has on its leaves, which are edible for you if you're out in the scrub and you're hungry, you can uh, you can eat the leaves, the sugary little houses that the, the lerp psyllids make. But you've got then obviously all the calistamins and the eucalypts, which are big nectar producers. You probably don't want a red gum in most gardens in Melbourne. They'd be they would get much too big. But we've got many they nectar producing plants, which they will be happy to pig out on. I'm sure. And being a, a um, you know, being a, a well, they're bell miners. That, um, mm. that they, you know, they're they're, they're honey. They used, they used, I live in Richmond, and there used to be a lot along the river, and there's not so much anymore. So, no, uh, I was wondering why they might have disappeared and um, how to get them back again. I suppose. Uh, well, I, I don't know. We've had the same thing when we walk up to the uh, Abbotsford. Uh, convent for coffee along the trail and there used to be a section where the bell miners always were there this is between the Collingwood mm. Children's Farm and the and the, yeah. the convent and they're no longer there but they're, they're in mm. other places and I what I love with the botanic gardens now is with that garden bed over in the what is it on the west south the northwest corner you'll always get bellbirds down there where they've got a you know a mm. bush garden a bush food garden um with a lot of these plants that we're talking about, and I uh, particularly enjoy that. No, I'll go and have a look and see what they're growing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question, and sorry for the background noise. I just had to hop on my bike. 
and this is kind of a self-serving question, but I advise into big de urban developments as a sustainability consultant. These yeah. projects typically don't have a lot of budget set aside specifically for biodiversity. Um, like, what would you say if I'm advising a client like this, this is the best bang for your buck option to, to bring reintroduce biodiversity to an urban site. What I'm getting a lot is, is like wildflowers. Um, um, and I'm specifically, I'm working, if this helps narrow folks, because I'm working on Fisherman's Bend, um, and which I know has a native fair, blue fairy wren population, um, and also Fitzroy Gasworks. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. which ones? Fitzroy Gasworks, which is in Fitzroy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd say all of those wildflowers that I've mentioned, but a lot of them are herbaceous perennials. So you'll probably need to replant every few years if you're using uh, organic mulch. Um, if you use rock mulch, you will get recruitment through rock mulch, but uh, they, they are only a perennial, and so they will live, you know, two, three, four, five years, something like that. Obviously, corriers and, um, oh, yeah, you know, tree vines, the medium shrubs will live longer than that. Uh, but the lamandras live a long, uh, you know, live a long time, and they won't die back like those lilies will. So you'll hardly know the lilies are there six months of the year. So it's good having native grasses, uh, Lamandra longifolia probably, or filiformis, but the longifolia is readily available, and the Dianellas, the flax lilies, Dianella admixta, the black anthid flax lily, is very hardy and a spreading plant. It'll it'll um, increase in its area, and that'll that'll go for years and years and years. I must say we used uh, bullbine lilies down in Gippsland. We were doing a big couple of hectare, a couple of hundred hectare restoration for the for Basslink, where they cut down all the trees and we got all the logs spread around different areas of the of this property, or not just in three or four places. And I couldn't drive around with my direct seeding machine behind, so we ended up uh, filling up the areas where the logs were, where I couldn't drive and tow the direct seeder. And we put in lots of divisias, the bitter peas, which are you know woody shrubs, uh, and a number of the other are ground flora. But the the ones that lived for years and years were the um, were the uh, um, the bullbine lilies. They're long, long lived compared to a lot of other herbaceous perennials that I've come across. Um, I was just going to jump in there quickly. Just mention there's a really nice patch of remnant vegetation not far away on the St Kilda foreshore there, and there's a range of indigenous plants. So maybe some of the things that are potentially doing well there could also do well at Fisherman's Bend. And I know, um, I know there's still a few remnant coast banksias, particularly in that St Kilda kind of Brighton area. Yeah. Um, that's a really hardy, drought tolerant and salt tolerant plant that would potentially be suitable for a place like Fisherman's Bend. Sure. Um, I guess it's it's potentially a challenging area in, in some senses because you, uh, my understanding is it's sort of like a reclaimed um, swamp, if you like, through there. So you've got an altered and we're sort of it dealing is, with yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're sort of dealing with this across um, a lot of Victoria. It's, you know, a case of find me a natural soil profile. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we introduced all range of different things and we've done all these alterations so we can get access to places like the Yarra historically for trading and what, what have you. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, things like the um, our coast bank share and even grey salt bush, I think grows quite I was quite going to mention the salt bushes we're using in more and more. Yeah, a and long and another, another weeds. Yeah, another drought tolerant, hardy plant. Um, and of course, uh, savory salt bush. Exactly. Yeah, the regadia handliana. Yep, and even the coria alba, the white coria, um, and that was used as a that. That's also a nice plant to include because it's got um some uses and can the leaves actually can be used as a substitute substitute in tea make a cup of tea yeah so there you go i mean it's nice to have those connections as well well and this is what i said did i 
say before, that wherever you are, you've got 250 species, something like that, the bulk of which are all the little ones. And you've got specifically um, the, the coastal ones, which are much happier often in, in sandier soil. Um, but it, wherever you are, you'll have 250 species, 300 to choose from in any sort of council area. And That's I'd certainly super be recommending Thank the you. silver banks here if you're away from the coast. Mm. And there's a lot of interest of trying to get the silver banks here back. I know there's virtually, there's no wild populations left in all of the Plenty River catchment. The last few that used to be in the Yanarine Reservoir Reserve have gone. And that, so there's a lot of interest in Banksy's across Victoria. And whether, I think climate change may well sort them out, uh, unfortunately. But that's the other beauty of using the salt bushes. Most of them grow naturally up in the Riverina and up in the Mallee and the Wimmera. So they're drought tolerant. So if you're looking at, uh, for the, you know, the, there's a lot to be said for the salt bushes now. Seabury salt bush, ruby salt bush, which is one of the best little bush food plants for school gardens because they fruit for months. Um, the Ionardia newtons, the, the nodding salt bush, I think it's called. Yep. Uh, and then a lot of the, the atroplex, atroplex semi -bicarsin. And we were doing grassland burns out of Tr Truganina estate for one of the, you know, the, 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 um, the developer companies, and there were these native grasslands there. And this is in April when you when you when you can uh, burn, and uh, we you know setting fire to all this grass everywhere, and you, you when you and then you're putting it out. Well, you, you've got a fire truck with you, and you have to pick your days and all that sort of thing. That there'll be no wind and that sort of thing. But at the, the fire, the fire hardly touched the atroplex semibacata. So plants with salt, salt, salt. The salt bush family have very low flammability. So that's a real bonus if fire can be an issue. And this is where we're using a lot of grasses. Usually grasses are the things that carry most fires. But if you've got lots of salt bushes around, uh, they'll be fine in many fires. They're very low flammability. And so it's something you can readily incorporate, particularly in outer suburban areas where you can get grass fires. It can be an issue. And, and even things like your kangaroo grass could potentially grow there as well. It's another, another it's a, it's a summer active. It'll be green, yeah. green in over the, much of the summer. Another another hardy <laughs> native grass, and it's got the um, attractive uh, flowers that which then turn into seed later on. So, my little lawn at home. What I do have. It's Microlina, like you were mentioning before, the, the weeping grass lawn. You just set your mower high, so you want your mower on a high setting. You don't want to cut it too close. Mm. But and let, um, let, oh, sorry, I was just going to say thank you. This is all incredibly helpful information, Rob and Jim. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Rob and Jim, and thank you, Cam. Um, and also thank you, everyone, for attending. We've gone a little bit over time because we've, there's just so much interesting information. And if you would like to get involved um, with the Growing Friends, Jim's uh, volunteer plant group, they gather every Wednesday between 10 and 12, just behind the Vink car park. Um, it's on Yarra Bend. Um, if you Google Vink, Victorian Indigenous uh, Nurseries Co-op. <laughs> nurseries Co-op. Yeah. Then you can find find it on Google Maps and um, and, and, and what time can... what time is that on? That's oh, from ten what... to twelve on a Wednesday. Yep, there you go. Yeah, I liked we'll... your bit of habitat where you. What was the, that? Was a um, what are those birds? The daggy ones that were calling when you were talking. Uh, oh. When you get to but, 70s, I can't remember names anymore. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Oh, anyway, I'll just wind up as well because we've got um, one last thing. We actually are holding a giveaway of some native plants, Yarra River Keeper in co cooperation with Think. We're putting together a giveaway um, and you can plant some of these native or sorry indigenous plants in your garden and hopefully attract some wildlife to your garden and provide habitat as well as like a little island of 
um, refuge for wildlife. And they're coming um, from Vink, I think, aren't they, Katrina? Yes, yes. They, they will be coming from Vink. And I guess that is all for this webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And apologies to the people who have only just joined. There was a bit of a mix up with the daylight saving timing and the event bright. So this has been recorded and I'll send a link to the recording to everyone who registered for the event, as well as a little survey. And if you're free on Saturday, October, uh, sorry, Saturday, 29th of October, come down to Abbotsford Market and I'll be there and you can pick up a plant and have a little chat and talk about biodiversity and Indigenous plants and the little the little acts that we can do to add beauty to our local little area. Um, thank you and have a great night, everyone. See you. Thank you. <laughs>